my Steve Bannon jacket on. Was <laughs> your Steve your Bannon Steve jacket? jacket. <laughs> we should talk about that. <laughs> Tell me about your Steve Bannon jacket. My Steve Bannon jacket. I stole it from my husband. My um, um, what, what I makes it a Steve Bannon puppy. jacket um, uh, particularly? Is it just the kind well, of just look at it? This is just the the thing that Steve Bannon would wear, right? Because it's militaristic or something, or, or it's got the it's the color, the tone, the the sort of slightly army surplus uh -huh. look, you know? Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Partial hipster, partial army surplus. I see. Yeah, trying to be like with the people kind of thing, but still being. But mm. still being. Seeing the game as a, a tough guy or something, yeah. Or yeah. seeing, yeah, mm. it's a game, it's all a big game, uh -huh. and it's all Dungeons and Dragons, some kind of you know, food supply complex systems, Santa Fe Institute level, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we can just take everything to scale, uh huh. Oh, yeah, you have to scale everything, I see, yeah. Right. So that's kind of the the opposite point of view of where you come from, uh, in a way. Am I getting that right? Or well, I mean, I gotta tell you that it's. Uh, I think it maybe it's a good starting place because um, we're so. When I say we, I mean that there's this. Western cultural history that has baked us in so deeply into a matrix mm -hmm. that um, that it's it's very difficult. And when I, I mean, I'm uncomfortable saying we or us in this because mm -hmm. it's such a different experience for different levels at which this current or existing system has either benefited or betrayed. Mm -hmm. But in either department, there's a bake in. There's, in there's, either department, there's a baked in. There's a there's deep, a baked in. Mm -hmm. A deep, you know, multi decades, multi generations of of um, brokenness. Mm -hmm. I either was just talking to Zach Stein, and he talked about unpatterning. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, do you think? this event that's happening to everybody right now is unpatterning us. Um, I don't know what unpatterning is. I don't know what unlearning is. I feel like it's like mm -hmm. music. Okay. The music is already playing. The question is, what are you going to bring into that? It's more like alchemy as far as I can see. Uh, right? you're, you're making so it's changing music. patterns rather than. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the thing to think about is, you know, like an existing painting that another another layer of paint or landscape comes into that changes the last one. Hmm. Hmm. Or, you know, when you are starting with a soup and you have a certain set of flavors and then you add something and all those flavors take another direction, another, they feel differently. Oh, you know, that's like, a good way to look at it maybe because then we're not thinking in terms of, uh, with, without a continuity. Uh, um. Because there is always a continuity, isn't there, between what yeah. the past and what's happening now? It didn't just happen from nothing, and we're not just starting over or anything. And no. there's no way to get it out of us, uh -huh. right? There's no way to get the trauma of the last several decades out of the vulnerable communities that have been destroyed by it. There's no way to get the suspicions and the, the, the experience of luxury and comfort that has been the product of so much exploitation out of those aspects of those groupings of people in the culture who have benefited from it. Hmm. Yeah. Right. So it's about, I mean, for me, this came really clear when we were talking about gender questions. Uh -huh. and oh. It's like, oh, if only we could change this gender's behavior. And I said, well, 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 hold on a second. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we even get, how, how does one, begin to find the beginning and the end of that right again that's complexity isn't it just just because yeah. gender is, is so co complex and it's not just one thing right that, that's what 
Um, I was I wanted to ask you about that actually. That was one of my the things I wanted to ask you about it because I thought you might have a nuanced answer. Um, because a lot of people are talking about how uh, you know uh, they're talking about some kind of paradigm change and and it's 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 a shift in gender of of some kind or. Um, and also you're, you're a woman and, and, and there's a lot more male voices out there. Mm. So, so, um, yeah, can you, can you elaborate a little bit? Can you speak a bit more about that? What, what you mean by that? Yeah, I, I, um, I wrote this paper about it for MIT and it's called, I want you to want me to want you. Hmm. And, um, I, it's a really looking at sort of the trans contextual processes there that this is cultural this is economic this is this is um this is in the education system this is has everything to do with intergenerational learning this is in the media it's in technology it's in our whole formation of identity and it's at the level even of physiology so of, when you mean it do you mean gender roles or the gender conundrum let's put uh-huh. it that way the gender pain the gender brokenness the gender possibilities mm. right all of that stuff is um deep in the complexity of the situation and it's just the same thinking um that got us into this mess that says what we have to do is make the following adjustments mm. in this department or that department and I guess my feeling is that, um, you know, when I think about even, like I was just about to say, it's even physiological. So, you know, what, what turns you on? Like what makes your body respond? Hmm. And that's ideas, that's experience, that's narratives, that's mythologies, that's generations of stuff there. What is sexy? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. So it's well, I think, a wild reductionism to think we can just, that, that, that it's possible to fix this in, in one spot or another, but rather I think it's maybe a better approach to just pause mm-hmm. and okay. not be looking for a solution. Not, not be, be looking be, for definitions of what may, men and women are uh, like strict definitions. Is that, is that what you mean? And, and not be looking for the new rules of the game, right? Uh, so if, uh, if the rules of the seduction game are, and the seduction habits and cultures and expectations are, have let us down, because I think they've let everybody down personally. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think that men have suffered a great deal. Women have suffered a great deal. People who are um, in genders that are in between there or who have, you know, experienced that in, in other forms of their sexuality, this, this modality has been a, a painful, uh, has a painful history in which people in all directions have been badly hurt. Mm-hmm. So, um, so what's the pain you're t- like, there's two things I'm getting here, the pain and then the possibility you talked, you said yeah. possibility. So, so, Maybe the pain is a little bit more, it's, it's more discussed, more, maybe not. Mm. But, uh, but I'd also like to hear about the, the, the possibility, what, what you think the possibility for, let's say, uh, let's, a, a healthy mode of, of, of gender relations, or is that what we're yeah, talking about? I, I, I guess for me that health is, you know, and I think this actually really ties into the whole question around paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has to do with complexity Mm -hmm. and the recognition of each person's complexity. Yeah. And you know, I, what is a healthy sexual or, or, um, uh, romantic or affectionate relationship between two people? Well, that depends on the two people. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it depends on the way that they bring out various things in each other and how they're dealing with their culture and how they're dealing with the ideas that they came into. And so, so I mean, it, it, there are big questions in there. Like, is someone going to get hurt? Is there room for exploration? How much context is there? 
Is there, Mm -hmm. you know, there's all sorts of stuff in there. But ultimately, I think that's where the possibility is. And I would say the same thing right now for where we are in terms of this liminal moment between, you know, pre-COVID-19 and Mm post-COVID-19. That this is a moment where um, we go beyond that stupid lifeboat metaphor. Hmm. Stupid lifeboat metaphor. Okay. You know, the stupid lifeboat metaphor that says, well, you have to do it like this or you're going to break the system, right? Oh. You can only fit 17 people on the boat and there's 32 in the water, so clearly 17 of them have to die, uh-huh. right? Which is what happens when you think about this stuff at the wrong level. You end uh-huh. up with questions that sound like that. That's cold data, right? As opposed to warm data. Like you right? talk about warm data. In so your, the warm, yeah. And the yeah. warm data would be like, okay, which 17 people are really good swimmers? Which ones have clothes that are extra that can be tied together to help pull people in the water? Who's mm-hmm. got knowledge of, you know, where we're going? Who's got, right? So there's all kinds of questions that have to do with the complexity of each of the 17 persons. Mm-hmm. Let's make, not even say people, let's say persons. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. each person foot. is a unique um, constellation. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, uh-huh. and, and those are like just possible possibility vectors. We're possibility vectors. <laughs> mm-hmm. and sure. So... Uh, that's, I think, where I'm going with all of this is into those those details and kind of out of the um, the sweeping calculations. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because what I think, about, what about yeah. like primordial? Let's say I know we have a, a, a probably stereotypical idea of that primordial roles because I think that, for example, I think that you know we had a very polarized view of male and female. You know, mm-hmm. in, in in an industrial society, you know, and then we move into postmodernism, which just flattens everything, and and there's no definition, there's no contour, there's no, we're just all the same, and then we're moving out into some other thing where where we want to have a, a more complex idea of what male and female is, perhaps, but we also want to recover, let's say, some of the primordial uh, qualities of that. Would you agree with what I'm saying, or? I actually don't know what to do with that because mm-hmm. my experience says this. I wake up in the morning with my partner and we try to figure out how to get through the day as best we can. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? And that means that in every aspect of the day, in some way or another, we are having to go beyond roles, beyond the roles the culture has dictated, beyond the roles some of the biology has has um, maybe produced. Um, so we, what are we doing? We're in a culture that's completely dysfunctional, that's premised on exploitation mm-hmm. and extraction, and it's filled with all kinds of messaging that leads to messaging that leads to messaging mm-hmm. around, like I was saying, even our identities. What is a, what is a success? What does it mean to be a success? Mm-hmm. What does it mean to be sexy? What does it mean to be kind? What mm-hmm. does it mean to be um, important? Mm-hmm. So all of those questions come into what these roles and these assumptions and even our physiological responses to what yeah. is attractive Right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but they're, they're, they've been cooking in the soup Mm -hmm. of a really screwed up culture. Yeah. Stew for a long time. And so I'm really hesitant to lean back into that because I, in my experience, who it's possible for me to be Mm -hmm. changes depending on who I'm with. Sure. It's a relational process. Mm-hmm. And so the more attentive I am to those relational processes, the more possibility I have to perceive instead of thinking, oh, well, this is just how it is. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I'm very leery of notions of human nature because those notions are produced by humans. And so <laughs> mm-hmm. there's a there's a trap there. <laughs> there's a trap there. There's a trap there. Hmm. So let's say I was I was I was watching your, your film about about your father hmm. and um uh and he went to study um I guess in Polynesia, um, I can't remember the, the the names of the tribes with with Margaret Mead, and uh, well, I, when you were talking, I was just thinking about that, and I was thinking about how they saw, like how they saw what a human being is and its role and, and that kind of thing, like uh, compared to how we see it, and and how radically different those two views of, you know, of the world um, are. Um, well, I think what you're you're poking at here is kind of the essence of why this is an important conversation to have now. Because um, I guess what happens in that cultural confusion or the cultural curiosity or noticing that other, there are other possibilities than the ones that have been so entrenched and, just woven in every nuance of our language of, 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 you know, all of these, these deep ideas, they form a kind of matrix inside of which it becomes impossible to create change because the change is informed by the matrix that, Mm -hmm. that you're trying to change. And so you end up in this question of how do we change the system when we are the system and we're inside the system and ah, yeah. And and you know, it, 3 weeks ago there were all these issues that were absolutely impossible to imagine. Mm. Stopping the airplanes? What? Yeah. yeah. People wow. home with their kids? Actually, yeah. everybody became a homeschooler. That's a shock to me and that's 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 been an incredible for me personally, that that's that's been an eye opener. It's like I've always thought that I'd rather homeschool my kids if I had the possibility. But now I know that that's true, you know. Um, but I'm not saying that I think that it should be like that for everybody. But and and now we don't know that should you know that should just got brackets on it, and that should didn't have brackets on it. It didn't have quotation marks on it. It wasn't in question. Yeah, three weeks, six weeks ago. So that's a big shift. Huge shift. And and when radical. You talk, it's radical. Yeah. And so it's much more radical than the being home with your kids. It's the mm-hmm. idea. That is that possible. They, yeah. Yeah. The being really, home with you're your talking kids. about possibility and that's what we're talking about. This, I think this shows, even though it's just, you know, it has this terrible other side to it. This event shows certain possibilities. I don't know if these possibilities will be manifested. And I tend to be kind of cynical about whether they will be or not. But even the idea of them being, uh, there being a possibility seems to be extraordinary. Yeah, it is extraordinary. And I think when you were talking about Gregory and Margaret in New Guinea and Bali, it's, um, I think what's important about that experience that Gregory was describing there, I'm going to lean more onto his, his version of that. Um, is uh, the way that it m- brought questioning to his own epistemological assumptions. Mm-hmm. Right. So, right. right, it's not so much about forming descriptions of other cultures as it is about recognizing that there were limits on your own. Mm. Mm. And And before one has access to really perceiving other possibilities and ways of being, it can appear that marriage is marriage and money is money and time is time and, you know, age is age and woman is woman and man is man and that these things are, are is is. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and then when you start to perceive things in another culture, you realize, oh, my is is different than there is. So yeah. what is is in the words of <laughs> What is is? Uh-huh. What is is? And and that's an important question. That's the moment I think that gives us that liminal pause of possibility. 
Yeah. I remember he saying him saying in the film that you think your five fingers are five yeah. fingers, but it's actually the relationship between the fingers, um, which is way, way more complex than let's say our Im- image in the mind of what fingers are. And I guess, I guess if we're asleep, we tend to think in sort of fixed images of things. And the more we wake up, we tend to, the more we see the living reality, we tend to, those, those images kind of dissolve. Does that, does that make sense? And we, we, we just stop seeing the world as, as in terms of things and objects. And, and um, I think that's what your, you, that's what your whole thing is, isn't it? About relationships, seeing the world as relationships. Uh, am I getting that right? Yeah. I mean, the beauty of relationships is they're not fixed. Mm-hmm. Right. So if we see the world in terms of relationships, there's a lot more possibility for perceiving possibility. Mm-hmm. As opposed to if you perceive things and if gender is a thing or culture is a thing or an economy is a thing or an identity is a thing, instead of looking at each of those as nests of relational process, all of which are changing all the time. Mm -hmm. They're not things. They're no things. There's no thing, right? Right. So, So, you know, identity. What is identity? Mm -hmm. right identity is actually all relational Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's you know your relationship to the economy your relationship to the culture your relationship to your body your relationship to your the former generations your relationship to the future generations your relationship to ideas your relationship to music your relationship to your sexuality whatever but it's all relational and when those relationships start changing there's a question oh who am i Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, and that, that's the question that's getting poked right now. That's scaring a mm-hmm. lot of people. Exactly, exactly, because we are forced into looking into that question, whether we like it or not. It's almost like the big spiritual question has arrived. You know, um, it's 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 arrived in a mass or something, um, and it arrived from multiple contexts. Right. It's not at one context. All of a sudden it's, it's who are you as a dad? Cause you've got your kid in your face. Who are you yeah. in, in relationship to all this technology? Who are yeah. you economically? Who are you culturally? Who are you in your, the body, uh, your health, in your body, in your age? Like, you know, suddenly I am realizing that, you know, you and I, you, we have some gray hair. Yeah. Yeah. We so are not vulnerable. actually in the safe zone anymore. Yeah. And um, that, that's a, you know, that's a question. Who, who, who am I? Who are you in, in post-COVID world? Well, you're, you're more vulnerable. That's, that's for sure. I mean, we're, we're, we're vulnerable, uh, I guess, especially if we have gray hair. Or, <laughs> um, and, you know, there's a... a, a there's a lot of people who have been so vulnerable to begin with who are even more vulnerable. Right. Right. And so uh, that. But again, it's also, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I also think with the vulnerability, there comes the possibility to observe another kind of strength in you at the same time. So it's again, this double edged. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the lack of vulnerability is a weakness for sure. You know, the people who are running around feeling invincible right now, they're not only their own weakness, but they're a weakness to the whole community. They're showing the weakness of the media, the weakness of science, the weakness of economy, the weak, they are like walking around being the epitomes of of the weakest part of our culture because they're creating weak links with all the ideas that gave them that invincible idea. Mm-hmm. I am invincible. I'm not worried. I'm not afraid. I'm not going to get sick and die from this. And it's like, well, what you have just exposed is actually that you don't see that your health is not your own. Mm-hmm. That's profound too. Yeah. That's if people could understand that, perhaps that would be profound. If I could understand that, I should say people in some preachy kind of way. But because so, I guess the ego feels, inv- you know, thinks it's invincible, and you, we have we have this part of us in, on some level that is like, oh yeah, you know, um, it feels feels above the 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 above nature, above 
um, reality. It seems to be a, a big um, a big theme. It's an important theme of being a human being in this era, where climate crisis is looming, where there's all these, you know, obviously the economic, global economic system is not, cannot be run with the level of exploitation and extraction it has. The mm. education system is, you know, developed to produce this economic system. The culture's right, the whole thing mm -hmm. is running on this invincible drug. Mm. And it just seems to me that this question of actually being, um, being vulnerable and I, I don't just mean emotionally vulnerable, I mean physically vulnerable, uh, is, you know, like we could be some of the last generations of this version of Homo sapiens, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So this, this is a, a deep shift of, um, of, of humility mm -hmm. that's, that one of the greatest strengths right now is the capacity to learn, the capacity to see outside your matrix, the capacity to question, the capacity to um, pause, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the capacity mm -hmm. to, to look for the complexity of the persons of the moment instead of looking for a map or mm. um, a, a strategy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, 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 all those things you're talking about. I feel somehow when this happened, I feel like I, 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 all these things you're talking about, I had at least some understanding of them the, the, on a theoretical level, you know. Uh, but when you say it now, it's, it's something different than if you had said those things a month ago. I, I might have been thinking it on a more intellectual level or something, right? Yeah, it's not an abstraction anymore. It's, it's no longer an abstraction, um, and that, that's that that's I think that's an extraordinary kind of experience that maybe people are having. It's just the real is approaching. On, on a, the real is 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 more is more vivid. Yeah, mm. and it's uh, the the blurring is more vivid, right? So the the blurring of how can a health issue be an economic issue, be an education issue, be a culture issue, be a science issue, be it, right? It's all one issue. So mm. Mm. there's there's no way to pull this thing into pieces and fix it in its various roles, right? There's that roles. You can't, you can't divide this thing back into sectors and fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm. want that. It's not possible. It's not living there. Mm -hmm. It isn't the sectors, it's this connective tissue between them. Mm. And so there's actually nobody positioned to respond. There's nobody, no person positioned to respond. Mm -hmm. There's no ministry of the liminal, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. Sure. There's nobody whose job it is to tackle all this at once. And so you have... Oh, there's no ministry, but then there's the spontaneous response that is happening. Right, because anyway, we Anyway, right. Right, because we are actually living beings, and we're not we're not um, totally numb. We might be a little numb, but we're not totally numb. So there's a need to to respond from a different positioning. It, it's uh, I'm fascinated by um, the way in which there's um, these big questions. Um, even about you know what how how science works in this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. This yeah. Is, this is good because one of the questions I wanted to ask you actually, and from watching you know, your film about about your father and thinking about your childhood and thinking about the fact that you were raised in, and I remember him saying in the film that the arts uh, came came before science for him on some level. Like mm -hmm. the ground was kind of the arts, and that that moved into science. I'm not sure if I'm getting that that right, or that's what he he wanted to say. But I I kind of wanted to talk to you about that, um, the relationship between the arts and, and science, or relationship between let's say, 
a scientific response. We could talk. We could talk about a response to what's going on today, or and 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 uh, let's say a, a poetic or a, or a, um, artistic r- response. And I, I know that I know that your father sort of almost he saw science in a, in a very poetic way, or or something like that. Yeah, this is a really big, deep, convoluted question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think let's go back to this notion of the matrix. Okay. okay. And let's talk about how, what, where, where it's possible to, to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, because, um, you know, it's it's really all too easy to find what you're looking for, and the 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 issue around what keeps happening with trying to get out of the matrix is that the plans to get out of the matrix are informed by the matrix, and so mm-hmm. it ends up not getting us out, yeah, but instead getting us deeper in because the actual thinking patterns are what has produced the set of of traps. <laughs> you know, Wittgenstein talked about this, the fly in the bottle, you know, and the fly can't see that it's in a bottle. Hmm. And because it it's just clear. Keeps banging its head against the so glass. It just, yeah, it has no idea that it's in a bottle. So, um, and that's a little bit of where we are. And until you get these cracks, until you get these broken pieces, or you see something that is not of your culture, is not of, it's, it's, that's, that's breaking those patterns mm-hmm. or, or creating a disruption in them, it's very difficult to notice that they're even there. Mm. You know, like if you're in water that's, that's body temperature, you could just not even feel that water. Mm. And so that's, that's kind of what we have been in is, and we being. Well, we've had too much familiarity, comfort, and, and sleepiness, or something like that. Am I? Well, some people have, and some people haven't. Yeah. Some right. Have, so yeah. Mm-hmm. that's I, you know the 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 fallacy of the success of the existing system is only harbored mm-hmm. by the people who have comfortable living rooms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So let's don't forget that. You know, certainly in my work, when I'm working in vulnerable communities and places where there's been a huge betrayal by the system, those groupings of people are the fastest to see the systemic issues because they live in them, Mm -hmm. right? There's no room to have the idea that this is the successful system. This is not a successful system Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless you happen to be... um, you know, sitting comfortably in the exploits of it. So, so yeah. So what, what do we do? What is this business? What is information? How do we, if we got new information, would we even be able to see it? Mm -hmm. What kind of question can we not ask because we've never thought of asking it because it's outside the peripheries of the patterns of thinking that, that are familiar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So this, these are the kinds of questions that when we're trying to think about what does it take to have, um, what is the relationship between art and science? So the, the arts actually provoke the possibility for perception to take place because they provide a, an irrational world. Mm. And that irrationalness is really, really necessary. It's that, that, that thing, you know, that allows stuff it to breaks go. the matrix. It breaks out of the box. It, you know, and yeah. If you, if it's possible to perceive it, but, but there's also the possibility of using those same metaphors to generate our, and to pull on, I'm wearing my Steve Bannon jacket today, and mm-hmm. to pull on those, those um, fears and unspoken qualities that can actually drive us deeper in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we have every, every capacity as human beings to think what we want 
is systems change. Start to feel the passion and the fervor of wanting to create that systems change and create a change that gets us deeper in to where we were hoping to get out of. Yeah, yeah, and, I see that. And, I see that a lot. I think that's happening a lot. I, you know, I think the almost the fury that people have just entrenches them deeper in, into the system. They become pawns for, you know, the the people that are that are keeping them in that system. Or yeah, and and they nothing. I mean, I've done it. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's like so seductive that it's you. The problem is you don't know when you're doing it because it's it's that glass jar that you're in with the, uh-huh. as the fly. You just you, you know it's it's, but that danger is right there. So I mm-hmm. guess, you know, one thing about this moment right now is that since everything's different, yeah, um, it's a good time to to kick some addictions. You know, we, we, if you've ever been a smoker or had any kind of addictive mm-hmm. um, stuff in your life, when you're in a moment where all the patterns change, that's yeah. a really good time to kick. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But there's there's a kind of um, cold turkey mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. panic mm-hmm. going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bringing it back back to the arts and the, uh, the possibility of let's say uh, of, of poetry, it occurs to me when you were talking that that's the thing that, that the arts and the poetry can do is provide that depth to to ideas, right? Uh, uh, you know, because if we just have an idea, we tend to run with it and become very um, ideologically possessed on some level. But if 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 we have a, if we have a deep if if, if there's a deep um uh complex poetic sense of our experience then then we're 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 not so easily you know fooled by um by by easy uh, by by ready made or easy patterns it's a tricky one mm-hmm. because i think you can also look at uh, some of the darkest moments in human history and see how they were actually uh, fueled by metaphor and the arts. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it can cut either way. Okay. And, uh, but there is, there is a loosening. Mm-hmm. Okay. So once, it, but the question is once it's loose, then what? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Right. So, that, so, so our, the arts might have a, a quality of loosening up the fixed patterns, and then the patterns could uh, go into something extreme again, or something like this. They could lock, get locked in, or something more living could be created. Yeah, and and where does that set of pathways come from? I have no idea. I mean, where do, where does that happen? Where does it happen? Where does it happen that, you know, using that metaphor of addiction, that, that sometimes when people have addiction, they destroy their family, they abandon their elders, they abandon their kids. And then one day something else comes along that might be perceived as somewhat inconsequential, but it's the thing that actually allows the learning to take place. And Mm -hmm. there's the turnaround. Yeah. Other people never get there. Yeah. And they just go all the way down. And they don't they don't get they don't get out. So it you know, there's some and this is where I think we're we it's the trans contextual learning thing is really important. Mm-hmm. Is that there's um trans contextual, yeah. Or multidisciplinary yeah. or, or just knowing a lot of different fields rather than being ghettoized in, in one. Well, like when we were talking about identity, mm-hmm. what context is your identity in? You know, it's multiple contexts. What disciplines? I don't know about the disciplines. I mean, I, I think it's more contextual than disciplinary. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. So my identity, if there's a change in my identity, that change is going to be 
produced and, and reflected and engaged across multiple and through multiple contexts, right? Mm-hmm. So here I am, I'm stuck at home. Yeah. There's a ch- change. And that change is in my relationship with my partner. It's in my relationship with my, even my wardrobe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? I just wear uh, my pajamas all the time. <laughs> I know. We're all in these Zoom sessions. So we might look good from the yeah, top. Yeah, just up, the top up. Right? Everybody's in their sweatpants. Everybody's yeah. in their sweatpants. And, you know. <laughs> so, but, but also what I'm eating, what I'm thinking about, what I'm mm-hmm. reading, what kind of uh, conversations I'm having. You know, I, I don't spend any of that time that I used to spend plotting and planning schedules. Yeah. Oh, that whole conversation is gone. Um, I'm not spending any time booking airplane tickets. I'm not spending any time producing PowerPoints for keynotes. Yeah. I'm not spending, you know, like my. So there's my, this liberation of time. Hmm? Yeah. So all yeah. these different contexts are changing um, in the same time, but mm-hmm. they have different time qualities to them. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, this is what I mean about trans contextual shift. If I had said to myself in February or late January, what I need is to make some changes in my life. Uh-huh. I might have picked a few categories to change. Yeah. I need to get more exercise. I need to change my diet. I need to have some more time with my partner. Mm -hmm. Right? And they would have been, those are like reductionist approaches to solutionizing the need for change. I've identified that something needs to change. Yeah. But do you see the difference? So you try to change them in categories instead of... Instead of finding out, well, how, how would you change? I mean, how do we change? Well, like, as you say, you say that's kind of mysterious. How the, you know, the alcoholic would decide one day that you know he'd suddenly have a turnaround and. Um, but something comes by in hitting from bottom outside, or... right? Something mm-hmm. came in. The virus was a systems change. Uh huh. Bringer it. Right. Right. It brought it. We've yep. been talking, you know, change agents. Yeah. Um change makers and And all this blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Yeah. No one was making any change at all. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then along comes a little itty bitty virus and now we're changing. So, but, but the thing is this, it, it wasn't trying to change one thing at a time. It came in as a trans contextual systems changer. Everything changed. Mm -hmm. And that's how, Systems change happens. That's how system change happens. Hmm. But we can't really create, let's say, a positive virus. Like, how would we? How would we create like a a good virus? I mean, what good is, and bad. Again, again, good and bad. It's, it's is kind of ridiculous, positive, isn't it? But what is positive system change? Yeah. Like how would you know? Like, how how bad do we have? If 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 the socioeconomic response, technological response to this is to create higher levels of surveillance and police state and control and all of these dark things that yeah, control, could easily control. be looming right now. Mm-hmm. Um, if that's the response, then my guess is there's a bigger crash coming after that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. So uh, uh, what's it going to take to learn how to actually live in a way that produces vitality and life? Mm-hmm, sure. Yeah. And and so where it seems where, to be in getting in touch with suffering on some level, right? I mean, I, I just think of the Buddhist first first noble truth. That's the beginning, right? So I was thinking, what could a positive virus be? But but no, it's not that. It's that it's that we have to get in touch with our, our suffering on, on some level, maybe. You know. Or there has to be a shift in perception of what it is that is is um what what are we learning? What are we learning? Right. So it's it's kind of an evolutionary question. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if there is the possibility of learning now that we, you know, that that economies that are based on built-in ob- obsolescence and exploitation and extraction yeah. don't actually produce life, then we have a different problem to work on, which is how then do we. Um, find a way to produce a, a, 
a, a decent way of, of being alive for 7 billion people. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's a different set of questions than how do we go back to the normal we had, which was actually, which was actually creating all kinds of problems, not just viruses, but mm, all sure. kinds of problems. So, so mm. is the, the, what that, you never know, and I don't think it's for anyone to judge, is this what is a good systems change and what is a bad systems change. It mm -hmm. is for us to not be numb, right? Mm -hmm. I get really itchy about the kind of discussion around what are the opportunities that are arising out of yeah. the, you know, because to me that is a, a red flag that um, that this kind of attraction to ever positive thinking could easily prohibit the pain and the sensation of well that's pain. why I, what i was trying to get at was suffering because 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 um I, th I thought so yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you ha we have to be able to feel the rage feel the pain feel the feel Work the it. crack feel the crack mm -hmm. in our matrix mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's it's never going to be easy of course not yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But the sensitivity to it is, I think, the the development of. Well, I, I was thinking that there's something about the capitalist system, right? Is that it, human beings? It, it it works. It works, and it destroys at the same time because we like excess, right? We just we just want to create more and more and more and more and, and we just keep going and we don't again we don't really stop but there's there's this there's this constant excess um which is why it does the opposite doesn't work when you try to control everything and you try to you know um you try, you try to have a communist country and you try to manipulate everything so that everybody is the same so both those kind of extremes um i was thinking what do we do with it, the excess, right, of human, you know, folly, right? Uh, uh, you know, William Blake says, if a fool persists in the folly, they become wise. And, um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's like um, this persistent folly that the culture has been engaged in for, for so long um, has a possibility that at least a few people, you know, will become more wise and that, that might be good. But it also has the possibility that a few people will go crazy. And it's a tricky one because sometimes fear and pain make produce contraction, right? And sometimes fear and pain produce learning. And it's you don't get to say when and where which happens. Hmm. You know, so there's there's I don't know what to say about that. It's just yeah. a, it's like it's a roll of the dice and. Um, yeah, well, well, I feel like whenever I, what you're, you're always trying to make me do is I, I'm trying to look for a solution for something and you, and you keep saying, hey, wait a minute, like things are more complex than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I have to sort of temper my, my, uh, my, uh, you know, my, um, like you could have a, a silly pessimism, which I mean, a, a sort of nihilistic pessimism, or you could have a ridiculous optimism. You have to kind of steer your boat in the middle in, in, a, in a way. You don't want to fall into this nihilistic dislike of the human experience or, um, or, or, or just become more optimistic when, when we're in the face of so much, um, you know, uh, you know, darkness all around. And so I, as far as I can see, it's double binds and paradoxes all the way down. Oh, the double bind too. Yeah. And so I, I think that the reason that I keep doing this to you and I'm, I apologize, uh -huh. but I, I do do this to people, but, uh -huh. um, but it's that there it's not about finding solutions. It's about standing in the tension. It's about being yeah. in and, and, and attention. Right. Well, that's, right? that's the thing in your film. I, I was struck by you saying, cause usually we talk, Oh, the double bind. Yeah, I get that. That's a problem. Uh, and that's how I always thought of the double bind. And you say, no, the double bind is the opportunity when you're, when you can see the double bind, that's the dialectic that 
It's it's a it's a um, it's a creative imperative. It's that moment when creative imperative, yeah. When there has to be another a whole another whole perception of this thing that seemed like uh, an, an impossible set of circumstances, and and that's that's what I mean about the um, the the lifeboat metaphor. Right. If you look at the lifeboat metaphor as there's 32 people in the water and 17 on the boat and that boat can only take 17. So you have to figure out who's going to die. Yeah. Right. It's the wrong question. It's a horrible thing, isn't it? To right. On somebody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But but I'm just using that because it's the kind of question that people keep presenting. Uh huh. Mm, and see. it's the wrong kind of question. It's, it's, it's like informed by the kind of thinking that is thinking about, um, you know, how many boards does it take to build something or how many parts are in the engine. And if you don't have enough parts, you don't have an engine. If you have too many parts, you have leftovers. You don't put extra mm-hmm. parts in an engine just to put extra parts in. Mm-hmm. But you can put extra people in a boat. Mm-hmm. You can divide the weight in different ways. You can figure out who swims. You can respond. So it's mm-hmm. it's like when you're asking questions and forming inquiry about living systems, mm-hmm. the whole thing changes. Yeah. And and there are these tensions and these paradoxes, these double binds that move in, in entirely different ways than if we were trying to, you know, solve for X. Mm-hmm. And and so I think that's that's where I I'm always trying to hold the door open. Don't be in a hurry to solve this. Just be in it because your attention in a in in a paradox or in a double bind. When you're paying attention, what you get is is the benefit of zoom in, zoom out simultaneously. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And in that, you will be able to see potentialities and possibilities that you didn't otherwise have access to. Uh huh. Right. Right. Yeah. If you just zoom out, you miss all the detail. If you mm-hmm. just zoom in, you miss all the context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But together, but that's a kind of um, it's a kind of exercise, a kind of muscle, a kind of. Well, that that comes back, I think, to arts and and the poetics, because you can't write a poem, I mean, or or write a song, or you don't say, okay, I'm going to write a song now. Like, you can't just construct some, something like that, right? You have to, you have to, you have to kind of, you have to be in a moment, you have to allow the moment to, to emerge or something in you. And then, and then, and then, so you're, you're zooming out and looking at it and you're assembling things, but at the same time, you're being taken over by something else. Does that make sense? Oh, so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel that all the time, even when, when I watch that film that you're referring to that I made, I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched it and thought, wow, I wonder how I ever came up with the idea to have put those two shots together. Mm-hmm. What yeah, a great right. idea that right. was. That was a really good idea. How did I get come up with that? And it's like this bizarre kind of, there's no authorship there. No, there's no, no, I agree. But uh, whatever the hell that whole concept is, it's wrong. Mm-hmm. It, it had to do with some, I mean, I didn't even see some of the, the things that I did that were the best parts of that film until years mm-hmm. later. Yeah. Well, I was talking to John Verveke. He talks about dialogos, he, about this kind of sacred dialogue. And he says, when you're really in dialogos, then this third factor emerges. And he calls it the third factor, this third sort of thing, and that, and that, that you know. Uh, again, you, you can't even put a name to that. That it's that it's, but it's definitely not. Um, you don't create it with any kind of intentionality. I, I, I don't think. I, I think it it just overtakes you in, in some way. Uh, on the contrary, I think if you try to put intentionality on it, it runs away. Exactly. Yeah, that's it's, exactly right. It, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't like intentionality. No. On the other hand, you have to do the work and you have to, you know, invite it. Like you, you can't just, uh, right. 
Um, yeah. You got to have the skill. You got to have worked for it. You got to yeah. practice. You got to make the time for it. And then you have to not let, be. Let so it okay. fall apart or something. You have to let things fall apart. That's what. Yeah. That, Get yeah. out of the way. Get out of the way. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's a funny thing. It's a funny thing. But I am. Um, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Where are we? What happens now? And we're, you know, I think this is a critical moment of the, the, the vortex of, you know, post normalcy are like, yeah. Well, I mean, for us, you know, and the word that comes to me is like groundlessness, but the groundlessness is, is sort of possibility. So I feel like, um, I don't know. I can't speak for other people's lives, but I feel like there's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. It's like, it's like something is opening up and saying, okay, this is how this is here. Here's what could happen. And here's what potentialities are there. And, and in, in, in in a few months, it's just going to close down again (laughs) uh, on some level. And then at that point, uh, we're going to have to keep whatever we've learned in this sort of, you know, in the, from this situation. And, and uh, that, that will be like, this is like a retreat or something, you know, I, I've done Buddhist meditation for a long time. It's a bit like that. You go into a, you go in, you go out into a place, uh, you go out, you go away from the world for a while. And, uh, and then you come back changed, even though things are the same. And when you go back, everything's a shock and everything's kind of hard to, um, to navigate. And then you realize maybe a few years later that, that, um, that you've maybe learned something. Yeah. I keep feeling that, that it's one of those moments that maybe is something like when you're on a boat and you're leaving and headed out to sea and you can still see the land. I think right now we can still see the land. Mm, oh, maybe, yeah. Oh, well, that's the other thing is maybe things are just going to get really weird. Um, just just completely weird. Maybe things are just going to go. So. Uh, I, yeah. You know, anything's possible right now. Yeah. We could go back yeah. to the land. We could go out to sea. We could find a new island. We could, right. you know, we could, we, anything's possible. Um, and, but I think it, it has to do with the details, right? Back mm-hmm, to the details, mm-hmm. back to the relationship between complexity and detail. So, you know, what are the ways in which scientific research is actually being strangled by culture? Mm-hmm. That's a big question. Um, because, can, you, can you elaborate? I'm not sure if I understand what you mean by that. Well, okay. Um, it's, a, it's a complex question. Because uh, there's a, of, of course, right now we're in this moment, and hopefully we'll look back on this tape and say, remember how stupid we all were, where really people don't, can't really get medical attention until they're in critical condition. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the basic approach at this point is still the ventilators, mm-hmm. which there's not enough. Billionaires are going out buying their own ventilator. Mm-hmm. Good for them. Yeah. Then have a great idea. Right. Yeah. So at least someone will be safe. But the ventilator is not a solution. I don't know uh-huh. if you know anybody who's come out of intubation. Yeah. But I do. I've heard some horror stories. Yeah. It's not pretty. And it's years of you know rehabilitation coming. So clearly the ventilator cannot be the solution. And there's, you know, what what about early treatment? What about, you know, what, what is, is, are there, are there immunities or are there not? This is an unknown question. Uh How, but we're also in, in a culture and in a, in a moment where the economics and the uh, cultural and the media and the, all of these things have formed this kind of perfect storm of nobody believes anything that comes from anywhere anymore. Mm-hmm. Right, we don't believe the pharmaceutical companies because we know they lie. We don't believe the 
the new agers and the alternative medicines because they've been lying. We yeah. don't believe the uh, politicians because they'll say anything. Just Everybody's to- been lying. Yeah. Not yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So actually, how do we retrieve, how is it possible to retrieve the integrity of scientific research in the field? Because there's no time for years and years of clinical studies. To, mm-hmm. right? So how, what, what on this, in this moment, what would make you trust or feel that it was feasible to um, get behind? Well, and maybe it's a question of also of personal responsibility as well. It's like taking care of your your health, um, because if you're just eating a lot of bad food and and you know you know overworking yourself and being burnt out and and um, your immune system is going to be weak and you know we're you know it's this whole sort of um, it's just, yeah I don't know though because you know there's a lot of people who are that are, people that I know that have been really healthy. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. That maybe. That, that, so that's, I see what you mean. That that yeah, would be. A, uh, it, it, that, that's taking. I'm taking out of the, the just the personal tragedy element of, of the thing. But I'm saying again, it's it's a question of looking at the system and seeing how the systems are 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 bad, like the the health system, you know, and um, bringing it to a more local kind of understanding. I mean, the health system has created a completely reductionist idea of health. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. So that is a deeply decades built in disaster. So, you know, this, your lung health is separate from your eye health is separate from your, I mean, dentistry is not even part of the doctor's office. And clearly my teeth are part of my body. So, you know, there's mm-hmm. this, this kind of separation that's been developed in the health sciences and then you add that to the kind of reductionism that has c- taken place in the marketplace around what it is to have a viable medicine for sale yeah. and what it is that how that then got ported into the research facilities and the universities mm-hmm. and the universities are really only able to look at one context or one discipline at a time. So they couldn't get the transcontextual information if they wanted to. Yeah. And so, you know, meanwhile, all of this has been building for years. Mm -hmm. And and that's part of why I think there is so much distrust in in the media, in the journalism, in the information, because it just doesn't have the context. It doesn't have, you know, the question is not, is this a, a, a proven solution? The question is, who paid for the research? Mm-hmm. Where was it done? What questions did they ask? How much contact yeah. was there? And, did they and, have an agenda? Yeah, and how much money are they earning? <laughs> how much money are they Off, earning? You know, from from selling Ritalin to to children or whatever or whatever. So yeah. this is, I think, the the kind of the 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 puzzle of this moment is we're back to the question at the beginning. What, what is information? We're back at complexity again, huh? Yeah. How do we know what information is in a complex mm. system? Mm. Because uh, it's a slippery question. Right. Right. What? And often we, we think of information in terms of, you know, in a very numer- numerical, as you say, cold data and warm data. Uh, um, we, we look at the cold data or, or not even. I don't think that it would be possible from looking at your, let's say we were going to do an analysis of you. Mm-hmm. And let's say six weeks ago, we looked at your economic, your microbiome, your, um, I don't know, your time spent at home, your, your age, your blood, your heritage, your DNA, your culture, how much you read, what degrees you have, what other things you've said. Mm -hmm. What would we have known from looking at all of that? Nothing. (laughs) About how you would be changing and learning in this moment. Yeah. Virtually nothing. Nothing. Yeah. 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 
That's my point. Mm -hmm. So, and, and so it, it, it's a trick. This is a really tricky moment because it, it, the question of how to actually bring integrity to this, this set of questions that face us of how to treat each other, how to treat this virus, how to treat the notion of what is a livelihood. What does it mean to? Yeah. What I keep, what's always so surprising is just how, how many uh, areas of life this whole thing is touching. You just mentioned livelihood, we talked yeah. about medicine. We talked about education. We talked about, you know, just about every, you know, every aspect of our life is being affected by this. Um, tiny little virus. So it's not even the virus at all. It's actually everything else as well. Um, um. Yeah. And it's, it was there. I mean, all of these issues were there. There have been people pointing to them for decades, centuries, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so we get it. We get an opportunity. There's that opportunity world. Yeah. But you've but said I, opportunity a lot, but you've also said that you don't like the idea of thinking too much in opportunistic terms, right? I don't like the kind of flat and sterile vectors of vision that the notion of opportunity can create. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? If I say, what's the opportunity? And we'd say, we could learn to think in terms of interdependency. That becomes an abstraction. Comes blah, blah. Yeah, sure. Right? So that's where I feel like it's important to watch out. And that's where the arts, okay, back to the arts. So occasionally you get these fantastic sci-fi writers who can really bring detail into those casting visions into the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are very dystopian. Yeah. Um, but But it's those details that most of the visioning lack. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. Right. So that's why opportunity can be a really it's a, a, a to say that can be an invitation to some really bad thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incomplete, a lot of incompleteness there. Well, I guess, I guess what you were saying about the science fiction writers is is that you know uh they're able to take this intuitive leap, probably, right? That if you're just thinking in empirical terms or scientific terms, um, you might get stuck in the in the um, you might get stuck in, in you might get uh, ex com combinatorial explosion. You have too many options and too many ideas and too much abstraction. And but but it's just the, the imaginative leap or something. That's what that's what creative people can can do. Um, or that's maybe maybe that's what education should be. That's what we should be trying to teach people on some level is, is, is to combine, like, let's say, as you say, the, the details and the context and being able to take an imaginative leap. The richness of mm -hmm. that multi-sensorial attention. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So that's why, you know, the, the, one of the problems with opportunity is that it, it brings a kind of flat positivity with it. It brings an instrumentalization or something or a very left brain kind of like, um, you know, it trying doesn't to, trying to it, get something out of it or to find yeah. something to, to, um, reductively or, or, or just not wanting to feel the pain again. You know, if you if you're like, but we have to focus on the opportunities. We have to think what could what we could possibly do with this experience. Yeah. You know, right. and at the same time, it's like, yeah, and I actually need to feel the fury and the grief at the same time of mm -hmm. you know people who's who are having to be on the other side of decision-making that says your, your person is not getting care. This other person is getting care. Mm. Yeah. Right. That's a whole mess that if I just turn my back on that and think, I'm just going to think about the positive side of this, because oh, that's it's terrible. Yeah. Painful. Then there's a numbness that is not able to inform in the way that that sci-fi 
artistry and imagination needs to have that multisensorial mm -hmm. information. And I also integration of the darker side of, of how, you know, when you were saying that, I was thinking like, you think of somebody making these kind of decisions, which affect people's lives in, in a cavalier kind of way. And I was thinking you would feel if, if that, if you were in that situation, you would feel murderous, right? You would, <laughs> I mean, when you talk yeah, about the, the rage you want, would want to feel, you would want to, you know, if somebody was doing that to somebody you love, um, you could easily feel violence to you know, a lot of violence, you know, um, inside yourself. And I think but we want to, we want to live in this safe abstraction all the time and, and not realize that we have those deeper, darker kind of, um, uh, you know, feelings. You know what it is, Andrew, is that there's, I think it's a really pernicious habit. There's this utilitization of emotion. Mm -hmm. And people will say, there's no point in getting angry about this because there's nothing you can do about it. Oh, yeah, yuck. Okay, there's no point in being frustrated that you don't know or that you're afraid because there's no way to know. Yeah. It's only yeah. the uncertainty, all right? And, and to this, I just want to say, fuck you. Yeah, because you're talk it sounds like you're, you're, you're speaking to children when you talk to somebody like that, isn't it? It's, it's a... It's a benevolent sort of. Uh, it's it's like saying turn off half your 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 nervous system. It's like it, it's an anesthetization. Yeah. Uh, at the very moment when we're walking on slippery rocks, and you need to be able to feel with your bare feet every piece of algae that you step on. Right. You need to be able to feel that in order to know where to go. And this, this anesthetization is a disaster. Mm -hmm. But to feel it is attention. It's rigor. It, it's hard work. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not going to relent on you. And if you dwell too much in the negative and the, the you know, and the, the dystopian version, you're not going to be able to perceive the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Perceive, stay in the possibilities and you can't per perceive the risks. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. So, so. So you're it, either you're either dis utopian or dystopian. You're you're projecting some future that, you, but not being in relation to the present, or you're you're um you're you're dwelling in how dark you know everything can be, or and you're not seeing the as you say the the richness of you know even the, of both of like the fact that there were, life and death are kind of happening simultaneously around you. There's this like possibility. And also, also some, when there's one possibility arises, another thing disappears. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, you right? have to keep asking the question, who am I? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And so the, the, this whole utilitarian version of what emotions you're allowing to guide you or inform you is a disaster because in the meantime you need to keep thinking who am i right that those nurses that are in that predicament are asking hard questions who am i mm -hmm. yeah and um if you can't ask that question because you can't feel the pain or you've shut out the possibility of that developmental process because it was too stretchy it was too painful mm -hmm. then we're in trouble mm -hmm. so my question then is how do we support each other through this process in a way that doesn't dull our senses mm. and it's it's the i have a little puppy yeah I just got this little puppy, which is why I missed our thing yesterday because I completely got puppy brain and lost my mind. <laughs> um, but my puppy was out yesterday and just eating all sorts of dirt and rocks and grass and, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, doing research. Right. And then vomiting yeah. dirt, rocks and grass all over my kitchen floor. Yeah. Research. In the city, they would eat chewing gum and, and cigarette butts and practically everything that is on right. the sidewalk, right? Yeah. So 
if I don't allow my puppy to eat dirt and rocks and grass, mm. there's um, he won't puke on my floor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It will have been very efficient. Mm-hmm. But there won't be the knowing. Right. And yeah. so I, you know, it's, it's, it's a big, it's a big, uh, it's a big question. And uh, particularly when we're adding this to um, societies of people who are already dealing with levels of depression and brokenness and anxiety. And, and then we throw this in um, as a, as a, as a crack in the matrix glass. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then what? Well, I I guess Gertschef said there's conscious suffering and then there's just unconscious suffering. So, well, it's been forced upon us. So yeah, it happened. Um, And it, it's going to continue to happen probably for a while because the fallout, from the various things that have changed uh, will continue. I'm quite yeah. sure. Yeah. Technologically, economically. I mean, how many people's, uh, I heard a story last night of uh, this, this one couple who two hours before the lockdown, the, the one partner said to the other one, I want a divorce. And two hours later, they went into lockdown together, and they've been in lockdown for three weeks, stuck in the same house. And oh, that, right, yeah. Did they work it out, or did they decide they still wanted a divorce? Or I don't know yet. Oh, you don't but know um, but there's other people who um, may have been thinking about it who then find each other again, or people who exactly. thought they had a happy marriage, and then they realize, actually, this was really working great when I didn't have to spend any time with you. Yeah. So, and there's, a, of course, an enormous spike of domestic abuse. Yeah, God. So, it's just, it's just right? everything is. It's everywhere. It's in every direction. And I think the, 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 um, the need is to try to think about it all at once and to try to, to develop the, the possibility to see and to feel and to sense and to, to recognize that complexity in every moment. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So in other words, don't get stuck in one area of, of the problem um, or uh, just, just always to be kind of not, not to lose sight of the, 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 the global, the total the overall context is that what you're saying yeah keep turning it how does this look from my food perspective how does this look from my kids perspective how does this look from the perspective of of people in other countries how does this look from the perspective of people in other economic positions how does this look from the perspective of my education like what what good is my work now what's essential hmm yeah. What do I actually have to offer now? Because I think a lot of people are going to come out the other side of this realizing that so much of what they have been able to give yeah. isn't really needed anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and other people might find that something essential that they had forgotten. or Exactly. Uh-huh. I, I know I, I was thinking about my own music, right? And I, for, I've been playing music for a long time. And... Um, and uh, I, I kind of let it slide over the past few years just because I've had a family and I've been working very hard and, and uh, I've been doing podcasts and writing and, and all these other things. And um, uh, somehow, somehow I, I've come back to, to, to music during the past three weeks. So that, I think that's kind of interesting. I, think I bet that's there's really- a lot of other people who might be finding something that they had, they had neglected in their lives and uh, d- discovering how necessary and important that is um, for them. I, I have found that absolutely. And I think, I think a lot of people are finding that. 
suddenly we're doing very different things with our time. But mm-hmm. I also have to say that I have people who are close to me who have been intubated and who have actually been through this and people who are, you know, doctors and scientists and things on the front line trying to work this out mm-hmm. and find new ways through. And um, the experience of the comfortable people at home who are having a little existential quandary mm-hmm. uh can really come off as um, well maybe it's irresponsible of me to just say that and not say oh yes but my my neighbor uh, had a stroke and is she's 80 years old and she's afraid and she can't see her grandchildren and you know I have to say that side too I can't just talk about I, I, I mean, I think if there's going to be a, an existential question, it needs to include the hard stuff. Mm, certainly, yeah. And um, that, um, the recognition that you and I are healthy today. We can have this conversation. Mm-hmm. And there's, it's not like this virus is going to go back away somewhere. We're going to forever be living in a world that this virus is in. We don't have it right now. Yeah. But we might have it next year. And how will the world have learned to respond to this virus differently by next year? What can be, um, what questions can be opened? What perspectives can be released? What imaginations can be delved into that might make it so that in the future there's another set of medical procedures, another set of cultural responses, another set of even, um, you know, even existential, philosophical, intellectual, creative, emotional responses. Yeah. Well, just the meditation on death is in the forefront and I think traditional cultures probably had more of a direct um, contact with that. And now everybody's sort of thinking about it all the time and thinking of their own possible death, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, that, that, again, that goes two ways, that people, people go into fear or, or, or people go into a deeper uh, reflection and, and start looking, as you say, at the details of things. And, I don't know of any sci-fi books that actually described this situation. Do you? Uh, no, it's not. I, I don't. I haven't read them all. Like I haven't read all the Philip K. Dick books, or I'm not. I'm not a huge sci-fi guy, but um, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, that again, reality is always stranger than fiction, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. Yeah. That's really the point, Andrew. Mm -hmm. But this has been really fun. Yeah, Uh, it's been it's been uh, marvelous, uh, Nora. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Thank you for inviting me. It's been a really rich conversation for me, and uh, I hope I hope uh, it's a benefit to uh, to other people, and other people can um, get a taste of your complex and interesting. (laughs) <laughs> we have looking at life. Oh gosh! Well, it's been really great to to be in conversation with you too, and to poke around at all this stuff. I mean, you know, there's there's no definitive knowing now. There's only inquiry. Mm. Poking around is a good word. That's exactly what we've been doing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we can do it again sometime. Um, I would look forward to that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, have a great day. You too.